So just to go through um, just kind of the general, when you're treating with Depakote, which is a mood stabilizer, and we'll talk in more detail, Depakote is a medication that increases the risk of polycystic ovarian disease. Do you want to use this in an adolescent girl? Not necessarily. Some of these medications have a higher risk of increasing appetite and slowing down the metabolism, some more than others, right? So in a family of individual, individuals with diabetes or high triglycerides, high uh, cholesterol, you want to make sure you follow these, right? Or you want to try to avoid the ones that can increase the, these, these risk factors even more so. History of medication response, uh, we've already talked about. Incredibly, we always forget that not all kids know how to swallow, right? We take a lot of things for granted, and swallowing pills is one of them. So we have to make sure that the medication we're offering them, they can actually tolerate. They can take it, right? And now we have different meds. We have capsules that can be open. We have... Um, the discounts, the ones that melt on your tongue, and now we have one called Safras, which you put under the tongue. I don't know, and it tastes horrible on top of that. So, you know, there's some kids that it actually works in, but it is, it's very difficult to get them to take. Um, so you have to think of all these things as well. We also, going back to allergies, there's been a couple of cases where the, we've seen that they are allergic to red dye. So anything that has that red tone, like pink, can have red dye and it can produce an allergy. So you have to think about those things also. And so it can make the, the patient even feel more irritated or they break out in hives and you're wondering, are they allergic? It's not the medication. It was actually the dyes that they used in the, uh, in the capsules or the pill form. So coming up with that one was really difficult. That one was not mine. I have to give credit to one of the colleagues for that one. And it was the red dye in the pill. Okay, medical conditions. In bipolar disorder, you always want, in any kind of disorder, if you go to a psychiatrist and they're not looking for this stuff, tell them to look for this stuff, okay? Or just, that's just, you don't always give everything, uh, you can't always attribute it everything to anxiety or depression, or you need to look for all these other things that can actually be treated even easier. Because if you're hypothyroid, you get Synthroid. Ta-da, treat it easily, right? The other thing is, if the person is hyperthyroid or hypothyroid and they're treated, their mood symptoms will probably go away. So why give them the antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics, which cause a whole bunch of potential side effects in themselves when you're not even treating the condition? And if you don't know what the condition is, right, um, as in why are you hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, what if they have a mass, what if they have cancer? Now, all those things have to be looked at, right? What if they have some immunological problem and it's attacking their thyroid, right? Lupus. Um, and going to lupus and multiple sclerosis, it, look, multiple sclerosis, lots of mood swings, has nothing to do with bipolar disorder and yet they can look like bipolar disorder because those are cyclical conditions, they come and go so that the person appears as if they have a mood disorder. And so you treat it and they don't improve. They might improve a little bit because antipsychotics will calm anyone down, right? So it, because it can cause some sedation. That doesn't mean that you're treating the psychosis. Um, so you have to watch out for this. Temporal lobe epilepsy. Okay. Temporal lobe epilepsy can look like bipolar disorder. And then you say, let's get an EEG on them because I think it's seizure disorder. The EEG doesn't show anything because the EEG, you put a little hood on them and all these cables and your temporal lobe is way in there where those cables don't show temporal lobe epilepsy. So you get a whole bunch of these normal EEGs and that really doesn't say anything. That means they're not having a seizure in the moment or we're not catching the seizure. Temporal lobe epilepsy, you have to, the, the electrodes actually kind of go into your nose and back there. Right? They don't go into your brain, but they're positioned in a different way in normal EEG. Your regular EEG doesn't show that. Okay. That's very important. So when a person says they have a normal EEG, you say, well, that's great. You didn't have a seizure at that moment. Right? It doesn't say anything more than that. Now, if it shows a seizure disorder, it's a confirmed seizure activity Right? if the EEG is abnormal. Okay, other things, infections, toxicity, drug-induced disorders. A person on cocaine can look like they're manic. Right? 
a person that has chronic use of marijuana, they stop their marijuana, it can induce paranoia, right? It, and paranoia can make you very angry and anxious. Uh, so a lot of these other, you know, ecstasy, a lot of these things, yes? What about uh, brain injuries? Okay, that's another one, traumatic brain injuries, yes. It depends where your brain, you know, what part of the brain. But definitely, that can make you have severe mood swings, right? And that you have to ask for, yeah, every, every time you do a, a, an assessment, that's one of the things you have to ask for is, have you ever had a traumatic brain injury? Okay, have you ever been hit in the head and you've lost consciousness? If you've lost consciousness, there's some sort of concussion. Something bad happened. Might have happened for a short period of time. But it was bad enough that you passed out, right? And there was some type of injury to the brain, even though it resolved on, with, you know, by itself. Okay, anything, everything psychiatric in kids can be confused with bipolar disorder. PTSD, severe PTSD, can be confused with bipolar disorder. The reason why they're in a stable environment now, nothing's happening, things are good, school is good, someone knocks really hard on the bathroom door when they're in the bathroom and that reminds them of when that person knocked hard on their door and then raped them. Boom, they have a cycle, right? It's, and they look like they are cycling. They are, they are agitated, they're irritable, they're hearing voices. They look like they're going through one of these mixed episodes and it wasn't, it's their PTSD that exacerbated. So that's very important. And again, we're talking about kids that can't really express this. They don't know, they don't make that association straight off, you know, when I'm talking, pointing at the door. They don't make that association straight off of, you know, when they knocked on the door, I felt like this. They just know that at some point, something changed and they started feeling this way. Right. Yes, the same in adults. Yeah. But the adult can kind of say it. They know in the, you know, I was in the bathroom, I heard this knocking and then poof, kind of thing. But kids can't make that association that clearly, right? And again, what is struck, PTSD, we'd like, we think PTSD is a life-threatening situation or a situation of harm that causes, um, high stress in an individual and then there's recurrent you know, themes about it with flashbacks and all that. Well, bullying might not be for us right now a big issue, but if you're a five-year-old and this you know, fourth grader comes up and teases you all the time and bullies you and says he's gonna kill you, that's life-threatening. That's a bad situation. You can get PTSD from being bullied and teased. Right? And then these kids start having these mood issues and oh my gosh, bipolar disorder. Okay. So you have to look into that. Kid, I ask you to say it really loud, so the person on the back. Well, I, and, and, and it's, again, there's vocabulary, right? Time out for, for us is very different than it was for that individual. I had this other, this patient, he was four years old. Um, he was mute, and as he started, when I would do play therapy, right? I would say, we're going, let's play some games. And he'd freak, he'd completely lose all control, and he was terrified, and I'm going, I've just said, you know, let's play. Well, well what was the game, right? And so he played the game, and they, it was horrendous abuse. So that word game was the worst, it still gives me chills. That word game was the worst thing that you could ever do to him, right? And we didn't know that until he was able to verbalize it, but he never could. So it would trigger horrible behaviors in him. Well, because he wanted to defend himself, right? He was aggressive. He doesn't want to be hurt the way he was before. So he would kick and bite and just out of the blue, bipolar. Right? No, it was PTSD. Okay. This FDA thing. I say this FDA thing because for psychiatrists it is such a barrier sometimes. Um, FDA, uh, and if, if you've heard any of my medication talks before, FDA is that it's, it's the government organization that gives, and we need the FDA, because the FDA is the checks and balances for food, for medications, for insect repellents, for a whole bunch of substances, right, that are out there that we need to make sure that 
that we're protected from, right? But the FDA gives an approval for a medication to be used in a certain condition, right? So the FDA can approve um, lithium for kids that are older than 12 years old because the studies show clearly that it works in kids that are older than 12 years old and the safety studies are appropriate enough for the FDA to say this, right? So people can use it and it can be advertised for this ill condition, right? More than half of the medications that we use as child and adolescent psychiatrists are not FDA approved. The FDA bases a lot of their approval, not a lot, all of their approval on studies. If you don't have the studies, the FDA can't give the approval. So if we only used FDA medications, we would not be able to treat, right? Some cases we would because they would respond to lithium if you're not 10 years old because then you can use it, right? Um, and most medications are not approved in kids under 12 years old. So this is very important for parents to know because a lot of the advertisement on TV says not approved in children under 18 years old. And then they come to the office, I didn't give them the medication because on the TV it said it's not approved under 18 years old and this is gonna damage my child, right? And that's very scary because I feel pretty confident in psychiatric medications that I know them very well, but if we're talking about arthritis medications or other medications, if they say they can't be used in kids under you know, 15, I'm not gonna give them to my kids because they're not FDA approved, right? So it's, it's very common that uh, compliance with medications is an issue because of this, okay? So you will see a lot a lot of children in severe cases on medications that are not FDA approved. Or on cases that didn't respond to the FDA, we try to do the FDA approved medications first. We try to use the medications that have the most studies on them, right, for kids, and then we use the other ones. Because we can't just say, well, then we're not gonna treat. Um, we have the antipsychotics, which are those right there, as well as Depakote, which is Valproate. Um, Depakote is for acute mania. So in adults, there are indications of these medications in acute mania. Person is manic. These are the ones that you should use to kind of bring them out of their mania, okay? And the FDA approved medications for maintenance, in other words, for long-term maintenance to prevent the cycling, are Lamotrigine and Olanzapine. I don't know if you've ever seen a child on Olanzapine. It's called Zyprexa. Great antipsychotic, right? As a, uh, um, it, it really does help with psychosis. It, though, has such a severe appetite uh, increase that the kids are almost like voracious, right? When you are very young, and we still, not all of us have completely formed frontal lobes, our frontal lobes are brake fluid right, puts the brakes on things that we do. Well, as the smaller you are, the less brake fluid you have. So you're very impulsive, you know, so all the impulsivity of a three, four, five-year-old is not ADHD, it's because their brains are not completely developed, right? And so when that happens and you give them, you, you give them a medication that makes them have a really voracious appetite, they're not going to think, oh my gosh, I'm over my thousand calories a day and I can't eat this and this. They're going to eat whatever's in front of them, even if it means they have to go to the bathroom, get rid of it, and then come back and eat more, okay? Um, because they don't have that frontal lobe. They're there just to satisfy the needs that they have, right? So these are things that we need to consider. If you have a teenager, what teenager does not really worry about their weight? Boys or girls. Guys, nowadays, it's the same thing. I don't think we should even differentiate. You know, eating disorders, the more we know about them, the more we see that they are. They occur in males also, a lot of it. You know, skinny jeans are not only for girls. Skinny jeans are worn by guys also. And now, I didn't even know this. I found this out yesterday. Super skinny exists. They sell them at Target. It's ridiculous. Right? So... The, the teenagers worry about this, about their appetite. Now, what is that going to do? It's not that they're going to take the medication and they're going to gain weight. No, they're not going to take the medication and they're not going to gain weight. So there's med compliance issues, okay? Gabapentin and topiramate or Topamax uh, in studies are found to be not helpful, okay? But Topamax decreases the appetite, so sometimes we use it. 
And then clozapine is like our gold standard in antipsychotics. It's a very good medication, though it has significant side effects, and you have to follow lab values every two weeks. You have to have a very organized parent and child to be even able to take clozapine. But it works, it works. But you want to use it in refractory cases because it's so, you, need, you even have to have a special, uh, like, permission to use clozapine as a physician. Not everyone can use it.